Hi, ladies and gents. Thanks for watching. This is Alex with the Green Revolution again. Uh, I'm here with two wonderful people who have the honor to know. This is Lindsay and Johan Rinkins. And uh, can you please go ahead and tell us uh, what you do here and where we are? Well, we are on the very far western edge of New Jersey, about a mile uphill from the Delaware River in the uh, Delaware River watershed, uh, in a plateau on a cliffside, uh, on our organic farm, which is a medicinal forest garden. And uh, I mention the specifics of where we are geographically because that forms the foundation of our enterprise, which really is a hybridization of ecological restoration and uh, agricultural production. Nice. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. And what, what exactly is ecological restoration? There's, there's a new term for some of our viewers, I'm sure. Sure. So ecological restoration, um, it's, it's the uh, rehabilitation and restoration of um, degraded or neglected uh, landscapes and environments. So, you know, uh, anything from toxic waste remediation mm -hmm. to curbing erosion on farms could qualify as ecological restoration. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. And uh, from, from what I've heard and I've been lucky enough to learn, last time I was here we had this mostly the same plants but they were they were about a foot tall or something and now they're some upwards of five six feet and so uh what exactly is this is it a food forest what is that you know unusual term and why should we care about it sure there's uh yeah there's a couple different terms for it food forest being one of them edible forest gardening being another one popularized by uh, dave jackie and eric tonesmeyer um it's the the crux of the idea is mimicking the structure and behaviors of a forest in order to grow food mm -hmm. so we look at the forest and uh, understand the different layers so the ground layer the herbaceous layer the shrub layer the tree layer and combine those different plant architectures in a way that creates uh, productive value out of each layer in the landscape and and also i mean uh in addition to all that, you know, quite <clears throat> ingenious biomimicry uh, that, that you're definitely in, uh, you know, working to make truly thrive here. These are perennials, most of them. So, sure. so we're talking about every year. You're not planting yep. crops that need to be replanted, reseed, replowed, refertilized, re whatever. This is all a continual growing system that once you get going, you know, there must be some sort of reduction in man and woman power on this, right? Once it really gets sort of thriving. To a certain extent, yeah. yeah do you wanna touch on that um well i mean i would just say that it's you going back to this idea of ecological restoration um, ecological restoration doesn't usually look like um you know a, a depleted landscape that suddenly is a multi-story healthy forested ecosystem <sighs> right um, right that's more of a landscaping endeavor maybe <laughs> but um it, Ecological restoration mimics the natural succession that would happen when the earth is repairing and healing itself. Okay. So uh, in the case of this particular landscape, um, when we arrived here, there was um, about a 200, 250 year plus uh, degradation of soil because that's about the time that this land went, um, transitioned from being a forested ecosystem inhabited by native populations to one managed in an agricultural context by European settlers. Um, so in that process, um, about uh, all of the topsoil migrated um, from this plateau here down to um, the banks of the Delaware. Hmm. And so by the time we got here, about 200 years later, what was left was primarily a um, compacted subsoil. And it was untraversable by machinery. So even if we were to say, and you know, I, I, th I think that there is uh, value to annual crop production for sure. Um, in fact, you know, that factors into designs that we sometimes do for other um, entities. But okay. we're always creating site-specific design. And in the context of this particular site, it was no longer to approach, it was no longer possible to approach the landscape with a system that involved um, annual tillage. Um, it simply was not 
a possibility. So how do you begin to engage um, in a productive scenario when you have conditions that preclude the traditional mechanisms of cultivation? And that's where we turn to, okay, well, how does it happen in a successionary system? Mm -hmm. And in a successionary system, um, you will have initially a pro, um, you know, you have a degraded landscape, perhaps it's been scraped of subsoil. Um, this often looks like what our edges of parking lots and uh, basketball courts and things like that, mm -hmm. where you have plantain and dandelion and there's this profusion of weeds that come into the landscape that then change the structure of the soil to accommodate the next succession which includes more perennial species of herbs eventually in this particular climate moving into what would be a mosaic meadow wildflower um, scenario and then follow behind that in fairly short order is a rising succession of brambles and small shrubbery and then behind that trees that will eventually comprise the first succession of a woodland restoration okay. so all of that is to say that's the angle that we took here in that we started with um, last time you were here we were probably working primarily in our um, annual transition into perennial herbs at that point so right, you would yeah. have seen plants that you know were only coming to about a foot or two off the ground now the succession that you're looking at now has transitioned from being primarily perennial herbs and annual herbs to uh, one of um, berry dominance at hmm. this point so you'll see that the el elderberries which comprise our primary crop here are fairly dominant in the architecture of the system. And which which particular plant is the elderberry here? Or are the elderberries? Uh, this plant here. Okay, so over here? Yeah. So this is so this and this is a berry heavy. So is the is the end goal to continue the succession as it should naturally occur? Um, you can see the little berries up here beginning to to grow larger and larger. Yep. Um, presumably after they've just been pollinated from the flowers, right? Right, so is the end goal then to have uh, in these rows and on this wonderful land of yours here some significantly large trees? Yeah, uh, we can actually take a walk down one of the rows and kind of check out some of the um, young trees that are populating the system. Right, great, uh, great. Currently. Let's do it. Yeah, but good. definitely as the uh, elderberry matures, we um, uh, will harvest that, you know, uh, into the uh, foreseeable future, but then throughout this. Um, plot in the farm will have trees like pawpaw, persimmon, hickory, chestnut, walnut, um, red maples, red oaks, anything that's site dependent or site specific to um, the uh, soil conditions that are present on site. Great, great. And can you repeat those names of those trees again for because I think that's a that's an extremely important you know part of, of the succession and a part of the uh, food food forest that you have growing here. Of course, yeah. We um, we're focusing right now on pawpaw and persimmon. Pawpaw is in shady or wetter areas. That takes a while to start fruiting. And what is pawpaw? Paw pawpaw is a beautiful native northeastern uh, fruit uh, related actually to, or relatable to what a mango would look like. So large, about two to three pounds per fruit. Uh, thin skin, but has a kind of soft banana custard-esque uh, flavor to the fruit the flesh of the fruit yeah I remember having one when I was here and I was like wait this is a New Jersey fruit yeah and, and yeah. it seems like it should be tropical but that is sure. a lost almost genetic species that you're bringing back in a way yeah yeah pawpaws used to uh, be fairly dominant within the understory but they don't actually survive clear cutting very well uh. so through the disturbance which is the other side of succession um, you know it's been slow to recuperate in the landscape okay um, on the other hand persimmon is a uh, does fairly well in kind of open field edges uh, is usually kind of quick to dominate those spaces and then behind that the tulip poplars your uh, oaks hickories maples start to emerge as well and are the oaks hickories and maples are those with the intention to harvest to use them in some sort of way or are they there to you know increase the biodiversity provide shade climate and have some sort of you know, a harmonious biological interaction with the plants to provide the ideal habitat for them. Yeah, all of the above, I'd say. Wonderful. Yeah. I mean, definitely looking at, um, well, A, they're present already, so they're going to be dropping their, their seeds. So in, you know, a non-till scenario, we mm -hmm. have trees that just kind of pop up after a couple of years. 
and so some of those we're going to encourage to, to come along. Um, maple and oak in particular can be used um, for chop and drop, so that's coming along, chopping off the green matter, letting that fall in place on the ground, using that to kind of speed up the mulching cycle that ah. would naturally be taking place. That's okay. a kind of classic permaculture technique. Um, they're also in our environment really good for growing mushrooms, so uh, both uh, shiitake and oyster um, can be grown on oak and maple and uh, you know provides a significant source of uh, protein and kind of secondary um, usage for, for a tree in the landscape. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I just would add that I think that, um, you know, in terms of, of the dominance of species, elderberry is clearly dominant mm -hmm. um, in this particular system because that, from the perspective of how you might look at a traditional um, monoculture crop, you know, you have your primary crop. Well, in this case, elderberry would be our primary crop, but there's increased diversity built into the system with the presence of fruit and nut trees, as well as the presence of smaller berry shrubs and herbs um, that form a complementary ecology um, or comprise a, a complementary ecology, um, but aren't uh, necessarily the economic focus uh -huh. in any particular scenario. So. Um, you know, it it, it, it varies, um, and so for that reason, because elderberry is a primary crop that we cultivate here, there are larger, uh, larger population of that species on site. Okay, uh, and and so with elderberries, can you relate that to let's say someone who's watching that has, knows blueberries, strawberries, and raspberries? Like, what what is an elderberry, and why should we eat it? And uh, you know, <laughs> come d enjoy this delicious fruit. Sure, you know? sure. Um, well, before I get into that, I do just want to mention that a system like this mm -hmm. can be set up with blueberries, raspberries, or strawberries as the dominant wow, okay. um, crop. Hmm. It would just look slightly different. So in the context of blueberry, there might be different plant pairings um, dependent on the acidification necessary in the cultivation of it. Um, or in the case of raspberry, you might be choosing plants um, that have a more open canopy because the straw of the raspberries are going to gravitate towards you know a certain amount of sun exposure for berry uh, production yeah, this reminds me of personalities of mm -hmm. people yeah and, and how yeah. you need to if you have a particular group of people and there's particular outgoing you know introverted uh you know enthusiastic reflective people that how you you want to give the sunlight, the shade, the space, this you know, the time to speak, even in this conversation, to just like you're you know allowing these animals and, the, and, and plants to work in this way, uh, specifically plants. What we have, you know, the microorganisms. Yep. So I thought that was just a, a beautiful analogy, and I think yeah. I, I thank you for painting it that way because I think a lot of our viewers are going to understand that. For sure. For sure. Yeah, there's there's um, also a resilience that's inherent in diversity. Hmm. Um, so you know should the elderberries go south for a season um there is a safety net built into the system in that um there will still be coverage in the rows there will still be fruiting in the rows um there will still be flowering in the rows there will still be food for the people mm -hmm. food for the people right. food for the animals uh, uh flowers for um insect pollination right. there's a myriad of enterprises that are happening outside the economic sphere of a particular organization right. of a farm. Yeah, humanity is uh, um. in, in our capitalistic <laughs> reach is uh, only just the tip of the iceberg. All right, now yeah. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, that's that's but, very true. Yeah, Yeah, but elderberry and, uh, you know, speaking of economics, uh, <laughs> um, elderberry is a really wonderful um, medicinal berry that uh, is what I think was going to be the next upcoming superfood. Hmm. Uh, it's got all the ha hallmarks of uh, antioxidants, um, anti-inflammatory uh, effect, um, also has an immunological effect on the body. Not great raw, in fact not recommended raw, but hmm. processed into what we primarily process it into, which is a, um, a, an herbal product called Elder Elixir. That we make elder elixir. Elder elixir. That's right. Yes, it's a um, it's a an ex a concentrated extract of elderberry, um, and 
it's taken prophylactically over the winter if you're trying to boost immunity, avoid okay. cold and flu, um, or it can be taken, uh, you know, as a daily tonic, as I mentioned, um, uh, the antioxidants and also uh, the um, anthro... Uh, Immunological? Anthocyanins? No, the proanthocyanidins are flavonoids that are highly anti-inflammatory. Right, so please, have... please say that again. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> the, the, the what? <laughs> proanthocyanidins. Proanthocyanidins. The form of flavonoids Cyan. that are um, highly anti-inflammatory. So they're... Uh, they're represented in um, a large way in the chemical constituency of the elderberry plant. Phenomenal, so, phenomenal. Um, and, and, if, and, and if you look at disease in general, most disease comes from inflammation. Yep. Exactly. Uh, pain, um, autoimmune response. Wonderful. Um, so, yeah, so it's a highly relevant plant, and it's also relevant. Um, the reason it was chosen was because it's highly relevant to this particular landscape, um, which... Uh, has more of a wet profile and more of a, um, a swamp ecology to mm -hmm. a certain extent. Okay. Well, I, I'm definitely leaving if you have any of that elixir left with some. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, I'm definitely. serious. I, I want some. Uh, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So the kind of broader principle that Lynn is getting at is um, something called ecological analogs. So when we're designing uh, with a permaculture framework, um, hearkening back to what you said about you know the plants and their space, we look at something called um, species analysis, and that's looking at the needs, yields, and behaviors of each species in the landscape. So you hmm. know, elderberry, as Lynn was saying, is suited towards you know moist to wet soils, um, and so where the ecological analog side of things came in was that when we were first doing the assessment on the farm and kind of inventorying the plant species that was on site already, uh, we came across a couple American elderberry. So <laughs> American elderberry, uh, again, native uh, northeastern plant, um, you know, generally does well on kind of stream bank or wet uh, swampy areas. And so utilizing that as an inspiration, we then, you know, uh, planted more American elderberry and we also planted European elderberry to increase the diversity on site of the product offerings but also you know to um, fine-tune it to certain microclimates with uh, Euro European elderberry actually doing better in slightly better uh, drained soil so okay. in our raised beds we plant European elderberry in our hedgerows, our stream corridors, our pond edges, we plant American elderberry. So. Right, because the American elderberry is able to um, adapt uh, to adapt to the compacted clay subsoil that is 